Well, tell me about how the whole idea of being able to get an airship to orbit and also Dark Sky Station. Well, that's our primary project. That's what this whole thing is about. All these odds and ends, pieces, sounding rockets, dumping out balloons to experiment. Um, you know, our airships, our big station platforms, and we experiment with electric propulsion, and there's all this crazy stuff. It all seems like madness, but it really does fit into one plan, this airship to orbit pr program. Um, which of all the wild ideas to getting to space, it's probably the most out there one. Uh, but we so say we've been working on it for 35 years now, and there was about 10 completely impossible things you had to do to pull this off. And now there's only about three more of them left. And so people will object, no, you can't do that. That's impossible. Well, we don't really worry about that because the other seven, we, we've passed those by. We've discovered that completely impossible things. And it's not that they're wrong. So they can prove you can't do this. I'll show you the numbers. Well, then we weren't going to do it that way. Thank you for pointing that out. We'll go around it. <laughs> um, the idea, instead of taking all your energy and burning it in six minutes, you know, riding the bomb to space, it would be as if, say, you're in Liverpool in the UK and you had a steamship and you want to go to New York. Well, if you do it the traditional rocket way, you put four million tons of dynamite under the steamship. You light it on fire. The steamship rides the explosion <laughs> over the Atlantic. And then you have the re-entry thing. Somebody's got to catch that steamship on the other side, um, which makes things very expensive, very dangerous, and not really the way to do it. Um, the idea is, what if you could stretch that out over days? You put the slow-moving steam engine on it, and you plot all the way over. Uh, well, the only way you could really do that, you know, the steamship does it because it has an ocean, it has a thing it could float on. It has a supporting medium. Well, we kind of have that, you know, that, the atmosphere. So our idea is we take it, we float to the top of the atmosphere, we go to 200,000 feet, uh, which is now altitude we think we can reach. The Japanese are going for the 200,000 foot mark and we're going for the 2,000 foot mark and a couple other guys are going for it. Um, 172 is the mark set about two years ago. Um, and we think we can reach that in about two years with the system we have going in with one of our airships. But the idea is you start there and then you slowly accelerate and climb going faster and you spiral out dynamically over a series of days until you're in orbit. It has the advantage of, say you're halfway through your orbital burn, your whole engine shuts down. You know, if all the shut, engines shut down in the middle of the burn, that's almost loss of crew scenario. You know, they have all kinds of bailout things that no one thinks are going to work. And, but if you're on a big, slow-moving airship, slowly releasing this energy, oh my god, the engines fail. Well, let's have a meeting <laughs> and talk about it. You spend an hour talking about it. You have the guys go down. You work on the engines. Can you start this thing again? Well, no. Well, you drift back down to the station. It takes, it, it changes the whole nature of space travel. The numbers are really crazy, the size of things. Uh, you know, the, we're talking an airship 6,000 feet long. But inflatables in the upper atmosphere, that's a whole different thing. It's like the Echo satellite. You know, you have a big thing hundreds of feet tall, launched out of a little container about like so. Uh, sizes and weights have a whole different meaning for ultra lightweight structures. Uh, and most of the technology we're utilizing is literally out of the 50s that was just abandoned because it didn't look like it was useful. Um, there's lots of different parts to this. We discovered you can't take an airship from the ground and go all the way up. It's just too darn big. What you need up there, if you try to put that airship on the ground, a five knot wind in the other direction, it'll tear the whole thing up. Because um, it is really an ultra low density environment up there that it'll be operating in. So what we do is a three-stage system, you know, like a three-stage rocket. You know, the first stage is an airship that goes from the ground to 140,000 feet. Now, the high-altitude airship has been the holy grail for the Air Force and DARPA and Lockheed and a lot of folks for a lot of decades. Um, last October, there was the Lockheed rolled out their airship that was going to break the world altitude record. It was shown in the media to be about a $200 million airship, but actually it was a $1.3 billion airship. That particular version, that one ship was the 300 million one. 
but they'd spent the 1.3 billion over the past 10 years building it and, you know, and developing that. And we were doing our attempt at the first high altitude airship and we found out they were rolling out theirs only two weeks before our flight. It's like, oh, you know, the Lockheed 1.23 billion, they're gonna eat our lunch. And sadly, um, because they are really sharp guys over there, and they really have a good program. But the airship went to um, 30,000 feet and then augured into a forest in Ohio. And um, two weeks later, then we went ahead and set the world altitude record for airships for about $30,000, and we flew ours to 95,000 feet. Um, fired up the engines, did maneuvers, turned around. We, the whole mission was about a two and a half hour mission. Um, we actually release our lifting cells at the end of the mission and descend on parachutes and had a nice soft landing and brought the airship back to the shop. So it's not, that was one of the, not impossible things, one of the big objectives. If the big aerospace, with literally over a billion dollars working on it for decades, can't do this, what, are the, what is the notion of an amateur-based organization, a volunteer-based organization that we are, um, pulling this off and beating them with comparatively pocket change. And actually, Tandem kind of came out as a bet. You know, we needed a, an airship like that. And we had just done one of our ascenders, one of our big air, V airship vehicles. And I had mentioned to one of the guys on the Lockheed team that I could beat their project um, with leftovers I'm building off the shelf when we disassembled our vehicle and put it away. And we got close, but we beat them. <laughs> So these things really can be done. It's not completely out there. It's just, it's more of a mind change than anything else. That the tandem vehicle is not an airship to orbit vehicle. Um, it's never gonna go faster than five knots. <laughs> but it's not designed to. It, it's really our assembly tool. We drop some of our V-ship, small V-ship test air, uh, vehicles um, for test flights. We're gonna be doing the, the raccoon flights off of there for the mini cubes and the um, Pongsats, and it's also the construction vehicle for the Dark Sky Station. Now, oh. swinging back to the um, orbital airship, the three-stage, you know, that first part goes from the ground to 140, you know, the high-altitude airship. So the second part of that is almost the craziest part, more than going to orbit, is our space station. We're actually building a suborbital space station. It's a station, a whole complex, that sits not in orbit, but at the top of the atmosphere. Basically, it's a big balloon that, that floats up there and continually circles the globe. Um, and it'll circle the globe once every 45 to 60 days, depending on the winds. And it's literally a permanent facility up there. And that is the docking port for the airships coming from the ground. And we've built... Uh, Quite a few smaller stations, two larger stations. We've built a 25-foot diameter station and a 70-foot diameter station. We're working on our first manned station now. And it's just a one person to 100,000 foot capsule. But we're, that's in the pipeline, it's being constructed, but we're still about two years off from the first flight. And the first flight is gonna be one to the staggering altitude of five feet. Where, and then we'll fly up to 50 or 5,000 feet, and then the hot air balloons will all laugh at us because we'll be all this capsule and all this high tech, and they'll be sitting there with your baskets going, what are you doing? <laughs> but eventually we'll you know, test it and carry it up. We're the slowest space program in history. We like to do baby steps all along the way. Um, but that, that's our waypoint. That's our spaceport. You know, putting a spaceport in the middle of the desert, and we fly from the middle of the desert, you just about have to, but it's kind of like putting your seaport in Kansas. You know, you want to put your seaport at the edge of the ocean. <laughs> um, so we want to put our spaceport at the edge of space. Uh, and that's also where the orbital ascender will be built. Built's an exaggerated term. It'll be inflated <laughs> there. And the modular components then put in, into it. And then that third stage is the orbital ascender, a giant V-shaped vehicle. It's V because of the low drag configurations. The stability it has to be stable across three flight regimes in the uh, subsonic, transonic, and the hypersonic flight regime. And the only shape that we found uh, that's stable and has the low drag configurations we're looking for is the giant V uh, uh, shape configuration. See, the largest one we've built so far is 175 feet long. It's a little bigger than a 747. 
Uh, we sold that one to the Air Force. Um, you know, we've built seven of them it's in various sizes, from four foot to the four-story tall guy. And we're building another 100-foot one now that's more of a technology demonstrator. We're taking everything we learned in the 175-footer, and it's cheaper to build the 100-footer, you know, and giving that one the run-through. And then you have this orbital, you have this giant airship docked at 140,000 feet. Um, and it never touches the ground. It's built in the sky, flies from there, does it spiral out to orbit over a series of days. And actually, there's still so much drag in orbit, in spite of the drag management system, in spite of everything we do, you have to keep the engines running full blast to remain in orbit. You don't have to do a retro burn. You know, people are always amazed at how much gas and gas pressure and lift you can generate in orbit. You know, the Echo Balloon Satellite, the first communication satellite, so everyone envisions this is this big ball in orbit. It wasn't. They figured out in certain directions, they're getting this bad reflection. It was half collapsed on, one, on the leading side from the pressure of the atmosphere. Um, so if you would have given that an aerodynamic shape, you would have gotten lift and changed the orbital characteristics. Um, so we're just taking advantage of that. And now, of course, this is completely insane. <laughs> um, there's no way anybody can do this. But if you could, the potential is so great. Someone needs to look at this. And if the only cost um, is a lifetime of research and a little bit of rid ridicule and having a good time while doing it, it it's worth the price to, to take a look at this. Um, so that, that's what we're about, is, is taking a shot, looking at this idea, this concept. I never come to conferences trying to prove to people, yes, I can do this. Because I can't. There's still so many unknowns. There's so many things. There's so many bits and pieces. We think we have a map through the whole thing. We think we can do it. There, we found a model. We found a way. Um, but there's a lot of, well, we have to figure out how to do this. We have to figure out how to do this. And we may not worry about all the knowns. I'm convinced we can handle all the knowns still uh, the hurdles in our way. It's things we don't know about yet. You know, how many people have done giant, blunt, hypersonic uh, deals of that size at the boundary layer of Earth and space? Not many. And we're going to find out new things, you know, which is exciting, too. Um, let's say we've been 35 years at it. We think we only have you know, five or six years to go. We feel it. That's on the home. I mean, a lot of folks think, well, that's a long time out of the way, you know. But for us, we're on the home stretch. You know, we're seeing the end game already.